Hi Year 11, so today we're going to be looking at obedience and conformity. So there are many occasions in life when we change our behaviour in some way in order to conform. Our parents, teachers, sports coaches and employers all are all authority figures who have the power to get us to behave in certain ways in particular aspects of our lives. When they ask us to do something that is clearly in their area of power, we usually obey and do as we are told. When we define them, we usually do so knowing that there'll be undesirable consequences. From a very early age, we learn that we must be obedient when someone with legitimate authority over us commands us in some way or another to behave in a certain way. Obedience occurs when we follow the commands of someone with authority or the rules or laws of society. Leaders in groups are often the most are in the most powerful position of being able to exert influence over other members of the group. So in other words, they're the ones that have the high status and the high power. But obedience is usually um, when you are following what they're saying because of their status, power and social influence. So it becomes important when the leader attempts to exert their power and influence over other group members, pushing them to behave in a manner that is different from the way that they would want to act um, want to behave or would normally behave. An example of an event was the gassing, starving and shooting of millions of Jewish people in concentration camps during World War I by Nazi soldiers under Hitler's direction. A lot of the people who were interviewed afterwards who were part of um, that particular movement had said that they didn't want to do it. But because their commanding officer had told them that they must, they had to. This is known as blind obedience to authority, right? Victims were usually unknown to their executioners and were in the main unseen. So in other words, it was never, you know, the same person that was capturing them that actually gassed them. It would be different people each time and most often it'd be done behind the scenes. So Milgram did an experiment on obedience. So... In a, in a series of well-known and very controversial experiments, American psychologist Stanley Milgram investigated factors involved in determining obedience to an authority figure. And there are different variations of it, but essentially this is a pretty famous one. And I strongly recommend you watch the video. So this particular um, experiment was to do with um, handing out shots. So what would happen is there would be two people in a room and they get um, assigned to either be the teacher or the learner. And what was unbeknownst to the participants is that the learner was actually in on it. They were an actor, otherwise known as a confederate. And what they did was they put them in two separate rooms and the teacher was given a, um, a shock generator box, which is this one up here. And these little uh, switches went from, you know, mild irritation to, you know, 350 volts, almost death defying. And it actually said on there, uh, lethal or very dangerous or skull and crossbones sort of deal. And when they get set up, they feel that first one. So they actually get a little bit of a shock. So they have an understanding of what it feels like or what it should feel like. And it, it's actually a painful experience. And what they actually learnt was, right, as they continue on, and they'll be, you know, given like a multiple choice test. And the first couple, um, the learner gets right. And they, they're following a script, right? The teacher, who is the participant keeps asking them questions and then eventually the learner gets one wrong and the the teacher is required to shock them and every single time they shock them you can hear in the other room this guy go ow that hurts that hurts right stop doing that all that sort of stuff and it keeps going and going and as they keep going higher and higher and the learner keeps getting um keeps telling them oh this hurts i want to stop i want to stop right the teacher is encouraged by someone in a uniform to keep going. So the, uh, the teacher, which is the participant, I right, would even ask the, you know, the person in the room with them, um, so the, the researcher, right, they want to stop, can, can we get them to stop? 
can we stop now? And he goes, no, 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 I assume responsibility, keep going. And most of them did to the point of 350 volts, which would almost kill somebody, if not would kill somebody, right? And they continued that, even though people had been asked to stop, even if the participants themselves, so the teachers, had actually said, I actually want to stop. I'm causing him pain. I want to stop. And they were encouraged, the research encouraged them to continue. So I strongly recommend you watch those videos. There's been so many different versions of it, but it is quite interesting. So the factors that um, affect obedience. It appears that there are several factors that influence um, that interact to influence someone to obey to an authority figure. These factors include how close the authority figure is to the person who must obey, whether the authority figure is being perceived as legitimate and having power, and group pro, uh, pressure to obey. So in um, Milgram's experiment, they found out that if the research was in the same room as the participant, they were more likely to obey. Um, they also worked out that if they were wearing a lab coat and, you know, or were in a very, you know, expensive suit, they were more likely to obey because they were considered to be legitimate, right? And they all, another experiment worked out that if the, you know, the whole group is actually going along with it, you're more likely to obey because the group is, so social proximity, legitimacy of authority figures and group pressure all influence obedience. So generally, social proximity refers to the closeness between two or more people. This may include the physical distance between the people as well as the closeness of their relationship. Milgram found that the closer the learner, so the victim, was to the teacher, the person administering the shock, the more likely the person was to refuse the administ uh, to administer the shock. So... In this same light, if the um, researcher is in the same room, they're more likely to obey the researcher. However, if the learner was in close proximity to the teacher, they were less likely to obey because they're in the same room. They can see the pain and they're not actually having the pain. It's actually just a recording. But, um, yeah. The closer you are to the people that are getting hurt, the more likely you are to um, stop doing it. And that's why um, the Nazis were able to get their, um, their officers to do so much. They pretty much would put them, you know, in circumstances where they weren't the ones pulling the trigger. They weren't the ones, um, you know gassing them they didn't have to look in their faces they could actually just put them in a room shut the door and then they just turn a valve they had nothing to do with it in theory so milgram has uh, also found that the te when the teacher was out of the room and issued his or her orders by telephone telephone the number of fully obedient teachers dropped to about 20 percent in situations outside the laboratory it seems that it's also easy to obey an order to do something horrific when the victim is distant and not physically nearby or visible. And that's why they're working on the ethical concerns of, um, you know, drone work and things like that to drop bombs, right? If you're not seeing the impact of what you're doing, you're more likely to hurt people. The legitimacy of authority figures. An individual is more likely to to be obedient when the authority figure is perceived as being legitimate and having power. During the Milgram experiment, the experimenter received a fake phone call requiring him to leave the room. He was replaced with another authority figure um, not dressed in the white lab coat. Therefore, their legitimacy uh, decreased. 80% of the participants refused to, refused to follow the orders and protested. Apologies if you can hear my dogs. Symbols of authority in real life, such as police officers, firefighters, security guards, doctors, are often enough to bring about obedience. When confronted by these obvious signs, reminders for who is in charge, many people find it difficult to resist. I have to fix that spelling mistake. So, um, think about it this way. If there is a difficult situation, the first people that people look to 
are the people in uniform. Always look for the people in uniform because there is an expectation that they will have some sort of authority and will take charge. We have this expectation that people in uniform will take charge. Group pressure. So an individual is also more likely to be a being where there is little or no support for resisting the authority figure. On the other hand, an individual is more likely to be obedient where there is group support for the authority figure. So you're more likely to say yes if everybody else is saying yes, right? And it's the same sort of thing um, when you've been misbehaving in class for a substitute teacher. Normally, you wouldn't act, you know, misbehave or do anything bad if you're... Uh, you know, if the teacher is actually, you know, there in the room. However, with a substitute, a lot of kids tend to misbehave, one, because they don't see the legitimacy of the authority figure, but also because if one starts misbehaving, then the next kid and the next kid and the next kid. So you, who's usually a good student, will start misbehaving because everybody else is. So when participants are ex Exposed to the action of a disobedient people who refuse to obey the authority figure's commands, full obedience dropped from 65% to 10%. Milgram's study demonstrates how strong influence is in affecting individuals' behaviours. Individuals will often rationalise or justify their behaviour by offering the excuse that they cannot be held accountable for their actions. And the Nazis did this as well. Um, a lot of the times, people would openly be racist towards the Jews, um, would engage in very bad behaviour towards them because of the fact that everybody else was doing it. And they're saying, well, I didn't really believe that the Jews were bad. However, everybody else did it, so I believed I should too. So there are some ethical issues. The fact that they're not allowing the participant to actually lead the study when they asked. Um, they didn't actually get informed consent of the uh, participants. There wasn't much of a debriefing afterwards. Um, they didn't look after the mental health and well-being of the participants. Um, and he, met, he wasn't very clear that they could withdraw. And that's a few issues. And we won't even discuss the fact that you know, prison guards and things like that tend to abuse their power, which is very similar to what um, Zimbardo found. So conformity. So we looked at obedience, now we're looking at conformity. So conformity is a tendency to adjust one's thoughts, feelings or behaviour in ways that are in agreement with those of a particular individual or group or with accepted standards about how a person should behave in certain situations or social norms. So let's put it this way. The amount of times you swear at school compared to when you swear at home is going to be very different. Well, at least I hope so, right? You guys, you, I've heard you in the yard and you use swear words like they're terms of endearment. But you go home and I'm pretty sure that you'll get a butt whooping if, you're, if you started saying those sort of things and calling your parents the names that I hear you call each other. So you conform to certain situations. In at home, you're most likely going to conform to, you know, the rules of home. And it's the same sort of thing that at um, funerals, you have a certain dress attire that you should be wearing. There's no set rules that say that you have to wear it, but you do. Right. And these are the social norms. And you follow these social norms because you want to fit in. Right. You don't want to be, you know, wearing bright red at a funeral when you know that almost everybody will be wearing black. You know that you should stand for the national anthem and you should be. Um, we've kind of lost that in Australia, which is unfortunate, but still. So Ash did an experiment on conformity. So in several classic experiments, Ash investigated group pressure to conform. In different experiments, Ash studied factors that he believed influenced conformity, such as group size and whether or not the group is unanimous in complete agreement or what should be said or done. So 
So he would show two lines to people, right? And he would go A and B. That's pretty good for me. And then he would say, all right. So these are the two lines. Which line does this one um, more closely represent? And most people would go, you'd say, all right, it is A. But what he did is he got a group of people and everyone was in on it but one person. So everybody else was an actor. And what had happened was these actors would say, actually, this line looks more like B. Right? And you go, no, it, no, it doesn't. It, it's, it's A. Although, having a look at it, it's almost B. Um, so, everybody in the group would say, no, this is B. But it was very clearly A. Not in this picture, but we won't talk about that. Right? And so, over time, the person who was going, no, wait, that's not right. It, it's actually A, would actually change their answer to the wrong one because that's what the group was saying. And they started to question their own ability. They go, maybe I'm missing something. So Ash hypothesized that people could would not conform in situations where they could clearly see what is correct and incorrect. So that's what he hypothesized. However, that's not what he found. So on the basis of Ash and other research findings, a number of key factors that influence conformity have been proposed. These include the size of the group, whether or not the group members are unanimous in their views, whether the group is viewed as being a valuable source of information, awareness of accepted standards about how one should behave, cultural background, social loafing, and anonymity in a group. So de-individuation. So group size. Ash uh, varied group size in experiments by having one, two, three, four, six, seven, nine, or 15 confederates. And confederates are actors. They're in on it. They know what's going on. Um, and they would unanimously and falsely state that a comparison line was the same length as the standard line. So they're giving the wrong answer. His results show that conformity increased with group size up to a size of four. So if you have a group of four plus the actor, you are more likely to follow what everybody else is saying. Beyond a group size of four, conformity did not continue to increase significantly, right? A group size of 15 actually produced a lower level of conformity than did a group size of three. And that's usually because a lot of people go, wait, then there's something seriously wrong here. Maybe somebody else is having problems as well. And people started to question it. So there was less conformity. Unanimity. I always struggle with that word. So imagine yourself in Ash's experiment when everyone in the group gives the same answer, which is wrong, but an answer that is different from your answer. That is, there is anonymity. An oh God, I hate that word. Or complete agreement amongst other group members as to what the answer is. Would you be willing to disagree with everyone else if you believed that they were all incorrect? Think about all the times that a teacher has asked you a question and or asked you to put your hand up do you agree? Yes, no, right? And everybody puts their hand up, but with you know, with a hand up of yes, and you've got what? Well, no, I don't agree. You're more likely to actually, you know, disobey. All right, you're more sorry. You're more likely to obey than what you would um, otherwise. Informational influence. In other experiments on conformity, psychologists have found that individuals are more likely to conform to the views of the group members when they want to provide a correct response, but they're unsure as to what the correct response is. So let's say, for example, in class, you don't know what the answer is, but everybody else seems to say that the answer is 10. So you go, yep, the answer is 10, even though you don't know the answer. You just say, yes, it's 10, because everybody else is saying it's 10. So there are, uh, they are both about the same price, uh, blah, 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 blah. For example, suppose you want to buy a car and have narrowed your preference down to two cars, a red car and a purple car. They are both about the same price but have some different features. 
You don't know how uh, much about cars, but you seek the advice of a friend who does. Your friend checks both cars and recommends that you buy the purple one because it has lower kilometres on the odometer. The tyres are less worn, the registration will take longer to expire, and the engine runs more smoothly. If you accepted your friend's recommendation, then you'd be conforming because information they provided influenced you to make a specific choice. Just as an FYI, always get a car with lower kilometres. Don't buy a, um, a Holden Cruise My, for the love of, do not buy one. I've only met people who've bought them and um, every single one of them has been a lemon. Do not buy one, just so we're clear. <coughs> Informational influence occurs when conformity results from a need for direction and information on the correct response in a specific situation. Normative influence. So when informational influence leads us to conform, we conform because we want to be right. So we want to buy the best car. Normative influence, on the other hand, leads us to conform because we want to be liked and accepted by the group. So we say, yeah, I like, what's the, you know, K-pop because everybody else likes K-pop. But do you really think that that's really annoying? Yeah. Anyway, moving on. Normative influence to conform occurs when our response to a group situation is guided by one or more social norms. So the group and um, society says that you should have, you know, the coolest clothes. Uh, you should have a name brand. You shouldn't buy it, uh, clothes at Savers. By the way, shop at Savers. My God, just, just shop. There's so much good stuff there. Anyway, sometimes name brands. We shop and buy name brands because we want that little label. Right? You should buy stuff because you like it, not because other people like it. Culture is another one. So psychologists suggest that there are cultural differences in conformity. The lowest conformity occurred in individualist cultures such as North America and Western Europe. We are, in Australia, a um, individualist, individualist culture. We care more about our own goals and our own needs rather than the group. And in individualist cultures, being an individual and independent is valued and encouraged, right? So there's less conformity in individualist cultures. There's still conformity, but it's less than what it would be if you were in a collective culture. Um, and... This is actually quite apparent in um, current times with COVID. Individualist cultures tend to all consider, um, you know, oh, I just, it's, it's my right, I don't have to wear a mask, it's all about me, blah, blah, blah. They don't consider everybody else. In collectivist culture, there was none of that, right? They even had worse lockdowns than we did and there wasn't rioting in the streets. There wasn't, you know, this whole, oh, this is my choice, blah, blah, blah. They were, okay, so let's sort this out. And they had, um, you know, families that got together and they did all, you know, they arranged food drops and things like that. Even in our culture, think about, and who, the Sikhs, I think it is, they did a, they've created a group and they were delivering food to those people who were in isolation and could not leave their home but could not order food anyway, right? This is an example of a collectivist culture, right? And that's what we need more of. I'm not saying we all go um, become communists, but I am saying that we need to start thinking about the greater good and the whole of community rather than the individual. It's not going to happen there. So the highest level of conformity occurred in collectivist cultures, such as Asian and African countries. In a collectivist culture, achieving group goals is considered to be more important than the achievement of individual goals. And individuals are encouraged and sometimes expected to place group goals ahead of their personal goals. These cultures also encourage uniformity, so everyone should be like everybody else. And values and values and beliefs that promote conformity and fitting in for the good of the wider community rather than individuality. We tend to promote and encourage, you know, people to excel and stand out from the group, 
whereas in collectivist cultures it's more along the lines of you help everybody to succeed not just one person and our society is structured in such a way that it does not allow for that social loathing is always a fun one Sometimes the presence of others in a group situation results in reduced performance or results in social loafing. Think about all the times that you have ever um, done a group project, right? You or maybe someone else in the group tends to do less work because you're in a group situation. And that's why a lot of teachers don't like the group thing, although they're getting back to it. Um, and so... You tend to make less effort when you're working in a group rather than what you would be alone. And that's pretty much what it is. Um, yeah, social loafing. The best part of it tends to be no more than a group of three, um, no more than a group of three or four. Right? You have a group of five and there'll be one person who does nothing at all. De-individuation, I had to take the photo out of this one. So a group can sometimes have a negative influence on the thoughts, feelings, and behaviours of, of its members. In particular, when a very large group or a faceless crowd, uh, people sometimes shed their normal inhibitions, conform to the group by participating in acts of aggression and other types of antisocial behaviour in which they would normally not engage. De-individuation de is a loss of individuality or a sense of anonymity, and this can occur in group situations. Think about it with riots. People who, right, there might be one or two people that are acting aggressively, but if they're in a group, a lot of people will act more aggressively because you can't catch everybody. And that's what they believe. It's the same sort of thing with in the internet at the moment. There's more bullying at the moment online because of the fact that you can do it anonymously and it's really bad because we're not taking this into account where we're losing um, our individual thoughts and feelings and we're just joining in with the group please don't do that be, be good right and yeah all right so anonymity in the group so in groups, when people feel anonymous or invisible and less accountable for their actions, they may choose to conform to a group which is behaving in ways they otherwise would not. So you wouldn't normally, you know, tease and bully a person in person, but you are happy to do it online because you can do it anonymously. So being part of a large crowd or unrecognisable through some sort of disguise, such as uniform or fancy dress, can lead people to conform to a group by doing things they ordinary would not even think to do. So think about uh, the Ku Klux Klan. They tend to wear white robes with little pointy hats that cover their faces. Um, and a lot of them right, are high respected members of their community. I'm not saying all, don't want to get it too into it, but a lot of these people feel that they can, you know, be rather racist whilst they're in that uniform, right, when compared to if they were in their community. Um, so, for example, a crowd protects the aggressive individual or football fan from taking responsibility for threatening an umpire because everyone else is doing it too. I actually support the umpires. Go umpires. Um, shifts in attention. When individuals are with others in a group, their attention is often focused on the activities of the group and events in the environment, that is, events external to the individual. This results in fewer opportunities to focus on internal thoughts. So consequently, individuals in a group are less likely to reflect on the appropriateness of their actions and will therefore give less thought to the consequences of their behaviour. So if they're focused more on what they're doing, rather than whether or not they should be doing it, it leads to more conformity. So they're more concerned with, uh, you know, what the task is than whether or not it's an actual good task. These are the activities, however, double check for the weekly plans. 